Okay, so good afternoon. This is Sergio Pellegrino. I'm a professor at Galsip, and uh, I will introduce today's speaker, uh, who is um, Professor Wen Bin Yu, a professor at Purdue University. And uh, uh, his academic pedigree, uh, he did his master's work at uh, Tsinghua University, and he was a student with Dewey Hodges at Georgia Tech for his PhD. He is the uh, director of the composite uh, design and manufacturing hub. And also he has uh, this very interesting analysis and simulation company that he's involved in called Analysis Swift, for which he is the uh, chief technology officer. He's um, um, a remarkably, uh, he's a, a remarkably uh, dynamic person. And uh, uh, one thing I like to say about him is that currently he is the chair of the AIAA Materials Technical Committee, and he is um, bringing new energy into that committee, um, but also his interest in structural mechanics and micromechanics uh, kind of feed into uh, the way he is uh, uh, bringing that new direction into the AIAA Materials Technical Committee. So I invite people to pay attention to what is happening in, uh, in that area. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Wenbin to uh, start his, se his seminar. And uh, uh, if you have questions during the seminar, feel free to add questions um, to the Q&A uh, or the chat uh, box. Um, they may get answered as the seminar goes, but at the end, uh, we will, of course, uh, have um, uh, a discussion and uh, uh, you will get uh, uh, every opportunity to ask additional questions. So with that, uh, Wenbin, when be, please, uh, please start uh, your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio, for, Sergio, for this uh, nice introduction. I'm honored to have this opportunity to share my research with Caltech faculty and students. I do, you know, I certainly hope that they, it was a, a physical visit uh, so that uh, we, you know, I can get more interaction with you and also appreciate the, the entire campus. Uh, but the virtual is still pretty good. I, what I'm going to share is what I've been doing in recent years. I've been working on the concept of structured genome, which has the potential to provide a unified multi-scale approach to bridging materials genome and uh, structure analysis. Some of you may have heard about the materials genome initiative. Uh, the objective of that initiative is to try to use computational tools, experimental tools, and uh, along with digital data to develop a you know, to use, the, use it in an integrated fashion to develop materials faster and uh, cheaper. Uh, but if you find out <clears throat> it mainly focus on the material modeling at the length scale, smaller than micro in the nano or smaller scales, or, you know, hundreds of nanometers. Uh, majority of these are done at the molecular level and it's not practical for, you know, my background is the structure mechanics. So it's not practical to design composite structures at that level. Instead, we will expect the uh, uh, materials genome initiative to deliver us the constituent models and properties and the interface properties for the constituents like fiber and matrix and uh, the interface between them and uh, these properties predicted at this level usually cannot be directly used as the input in the structure analysis. The reason being that uh, the structures we are talking about is at the meters, like fighter uh, cars and the airplanes and helicopters, meters or tens of meters. Then the fiber we're talking about is at the microns. It's much smaller uh, than human hair. Here. And let me bring out my pointer. Then, you know, it's impossible to include every details of the fiber explicitly in the structure analysis. 
Uh, the reason being that if you're familiar with finite elements, it's even hard, hard to cross two nice scales. Uh, for example, for a one millimeter material block, if we want to capture fiber details, you know, your, your element size cannot be more than fiber. Then you talk about millions of degrees of freedom. But here we need to cross 10 length scales from micron to the meters. And uh, we need to, and uh, we also know that structure behavior directly, you know, affected by how we engineer the fibers. So we need to find an effective way to bridge the gap between the materials genome and also the structure analysis. Let me use an example. Traditionally, for example, our uh, fiber-reinforced uh, laminate, what we do, and uh, we have so-called button-up multi-scale modeling. We start from some kind of unicell idealized representation of the material mixture, then use certain micro-mechanics calculation, could be analytical, could be semi-analytical, or could be numerical, and uh, to get the so-called lamina constants then use some structure series, uh, the most popular one is the classical lamination series, to, uh, to construct a structure series, then do the structure design analysis. Both micromechanics and uh, structure mechanics, they are two separate subjects, and we have all kinds of uh, models there, and also various assumptions involved. And the more fundamental assumption is what I call here scale separation assumption, when you do this two-step micromechanics and structure mechanics. For example, you have a uh, unidirectional fiber reinforced composite and perfect bonding. If you do this way, basically you effectively replace the original structure uh, with this structure made of three homogeneous layers. Then you shift the interface, discontinuity interface. Originally that the fiber and matrix uh, interface now become layer and layer interface. We create a so-called artificial discontinuity. It would be okay if the fibers are much smaller than each layer thickness, which is true for traditional pre prex You know, we have about 20 fibers with the layer thickness. Then for the global behavior, you know, a stiffness and vibration modes and buckling, that would be okay. But it would not be okay to get the stress concentration because even the material discontinuity is different. And that's why that uh, for infrastructure behavior for stiffness uh, consideration, uh, the classical lam the lamination series do a good job there. But when you go to damage and failure, because damage failure is a local phenomena, then we have difficulty to have a good prediction. And also for some situations that uh, uh, even the global behavior will be wrong. For example, we have a honeycomb in the middle, a sandwich structure with face sheet uh, in terms of laminate. Then the traditional way what we do is that uh, take, uh, if we use the bottom-up model scale modeling, we take a unicell to a uh, micro-mechanics calculation to get the material properties for that honeycomb. Then we treat it as a homogeneous layer to do a sandwich structure analysis. And uh, it will have some issues even for the global behavior. The reason being that uh, the size of the honeycomb is similar as the thickness of the panel. So when you, the scale separation is not clear. It's not at that three-dimensional material level, but at the panel level, which means the thickness and the size of the microstructure should be considered together to do the homogenization. And uh, this also could, uh, you know, this kind of button-up thinking sometimes also confuse structure behavior and the material behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I don't know <clears throat> whether you see this uh, uh, paper before it's published on Science 2017. And what this uh, paper does, they produce a new uh, meta material, and uh, they have a weird, beha a strange behavior. Basically, when you apply a tensile force, it will twist. So the, that's the, what title means, that the three-dimensional mechanical metal materials with a twist. Uh, but the twist behavior only exists when 
when you have finite only a few unit cells along certain direction, for example, you stack them together along one direction, it's kind of like a beam, a metamaterial beam, or stack them together along two dimensions is a panel, then you have the extension twist coupling behavior. But if we stack them all three dimensions, repeat many times, then the twist behavior will, will disappear. So it's really not a three-dimensional material property, uh, what I will call it, it's a structure behavior. Uh, to generate the extension the twist the coupling at the structure level, it's pretty easy. And uh, we, we do that, we can use regular laminates to generate that kind of behavior. So to avoid the issues associated with bottom-up model scale modeling, I have been searching um, for top-down modeling approach from the system perspective. Fundamentally speaking, for a structure, no matter how complicated they are, uh, they can be basically come to the structure analysis. It's a combination of three D solids. And uh, if all the three dimensions of that component are similar size, or uh, place and shells, if we know some components has one dimension much smaller than two other dimensions, and also beams, uh, if we know that uh, we have one dimension much larger than two other dimensions, or same world beams, if we have all three dimensions, they are of different uh, orders of magnitude. And uh, this is basically our mathematical idealization. And uh, when we do the analysis and design, we digitalize them as a combination of solid elements, plate and shear elements, and beam elements. And uh, what we have to realize is that this single segment line element could represent a box beam with each wall made of, say, uh, 20 layers of five, uh, fiber, uh, woven fabric. And this two-dimensional plate surface element here could be a stiffened panel with uh, skins and stiffeners made of composites. And what we need to find out is that the whole you know, how we can um, capture the behavior use this uh, much simplified mathematical representation. And that is what we call the models. Behind, behind each element, there is a corresponding model. And uh, if you're familiar with continuum mechanics, for each structure model, we have three parts of equations, kinematics, kinetics, and uh, energetics. Energetics also called the constituent relations. And the kinematics and kinetics will remain the same, no matter whether it's made of composites or not composites. What will be different is the constituent relations. And uh, uh, here I only use linear elastic behavior to do the uh, illustration, and uh, it can be go to nonlinear. And what I have to point out is that uh, uh, for composites, particularly anisotropic heterogeneous materials, the stiffness matrix could be fully populated. For example, for the beam theory, we all know the EIGGA, uh, EA, this kind of beam constants. But uh, for a uh, composite beam, we could have a fully populated stiffness matrix. All the de deformation modes could be coupled. So the focus of uh, composite modeling should be focused on the constituent relations and uh, the way to find the constituent relations is what I call the constituent modeling, because kinematics, kinetics is all, has already been implemented many times in the commercial finite element codes. So the mechanics of structure genome is what I proposed as an alternative to the traditional model scale modeling. So what we do is first we decide uh, what kind of model I want to use to describe my relevant structure behavior I want to capture. Then I decide at which level I characterize my material. Then we need to come up with some method, what's, what is called here, mechanics of structure genome, to minimize the information loss between these two representations. And some of the series we developed, they implemented in the code called SwiftCom. It is a formal framework that does not exclusively rely on just direct information passing across scales, but the rather operates from the homogeneous behavior, capture details as scales relevant to the particular design needs. 
Uh, this flowchart shows the MST-based model scale modeling. We start from the 3D continuum mechanics model. First, we identify the structure gene. Then we use the principal minimal information loss to mathematically decouple the original problem to a constitutive modeling over the uh, SG, then also a structure analysis. And the constitutive modeling over SG produce the constitutive models for the structure analysis. The structure analysis usually has been done by the standard finite element codes like Abacus, Nastrian, and uh, ANSYS. Then structure analysis were uh, do the, uh, do the analysis gave the global behavior vibration, buckling, deflection, all that. And, uh, but what we want to find is uh, how the material fails. Then we need to go back. The uh, so-called dehomogenization procedure still get the relationship from the constituent modeling to a dehomogenization. We will find out what happens within the material, uh, within the microstructure. Then you'll find out that the to use this method, there's three questions we need to ask and answer. First, what will be the microscopic model? So that is, depends on design need and the, how the structure looks like. For example, for a helicopter rotor plate, you want to use the beam elements to represent uh, the, uh, the composite rotor plate when you do a dynamic simulation. And what is the original model? That depends on what physics you want to capture. If you're only interested in the linear behavior, then 3D elasticity model will be sufficient. If you're also interested in, uh, in say, nonlinear behavior, hyperelastic or viscous elastic, then your original model will be changed. The third question is, uh, what is the structure gene? You need to identify the structure gene. Structure gene is the smallest mathematical building block of the uh, structure. And I will explain more because that all the others are pretty straightforward, simple, but structure gene has a, a new concept. Uh, that is uh, what I need to illustrate by more details. But before I doing that, I want to uh, use the subject able familiar with any engineering students know is the beam theory, okay? And uh, how we deal with the beam theory, we, we know all the structures in our three-dimensional space, they are 3D solids. And uh, we start from the 3D structure, but we know pretty long what we do. We basically look at the cross-section, usually traditional ways to make some assumptions, then do some cross-sectional calculation to get the constants, the beam constants. Then we reduce the original problem to a set of ODEs. To do the analysis, for example, this is the deflection, the bending analysis. Uh, for the global uh, global beam analysis. After we've done that, but we, do, we don't stop here. We do this analysis, we get the displacement rotations and the force and the moments, uh, you know, bending moment diagram, something like that, shear force diagram. And uh, But we don't stop there. If we want the failure, we want to say whether the material is strong enough or not, we use a formula like this. Everybody knows this formula to get the stress to check the maximum stress against the design allowables. So that's that procedure we all know. And uh, if we're talking in terms of the uh, language of MSG, then basically the way we calculate the beam constants, E, I, T, J, that's a homogenization procedure. And we have the original model is three-dimensional model. And we have a, a microscopic model is one-dimensional model. We want the effective properties, that's homogenization. And we get the global analysis here. And uh, then the way to get the sigma, the stresses, is a dehomogenization procedure. We go back to the uh, SG, or you can call it the microstructure, to get the local fields or distribution over the cross section. And this uh, shaded area is what I call the constitutive modeling. So uh, next, let me uh, show this. Uh, uh, basic steps of MSD to construct a theory, you know, that uh, uh, it's very, very simple. We only need to follow three very basic steps. For, because they're thinking about in terms of two models. We have our original model that's studying, but uh, that's too complex and too expensive to work with. We want the simpler models. That's basically what the scale modeling is about. Uh, first step is to express the kinematics of the original model in terms of that of the microscopic model. So in terms of displacement, they can be expressed in terms of, say, D 
displacement rotation of the beam models, right? And then you can get kinematics. The, the strains of original model can be in terms of the beam strains and curvatures, and also some unknown function. And usually in micromechanics, we call it fluctuating function. Then they express the information of the original model. If we're dealing with linear elastic behavior, we're talking about total potential energy. So we express the total potential energy of the original model in terms of the kinematic variables of the model I want. You still have the unknowns. How do we find that unknown? To minimize the loss of information. This information of the original model and the information of the model I want. Then you minimize it then you will find out the unknowns. Then you solve the problem. You have exactly the relationship between these two models. And without uh, really uh, a lot of ad hoc assumptions, we have involved in structural mechanics and micromechanics. So now let me illustrate more about the uh, structure gene concept. Uh, for example, for 3D analysis, and it depends on your material makeup. It could be basically binary composite made of layers, but it's a 3D solid. You want to do a 3D analysis. Then your structure gene will be just a normal line with the segments indicate how many phases you have through thickness. If you only have this binary composite made of two layers, but repeating, then you only have two segments there. If you have unidirectional fiber reinforced composites, you're dealing with a two-dimensional domain. Remember, it's the smallest mathematical building block because I can take this uh, two-dimensional domain extrude along the fiber direction to build that slice, then sweep along the layer direction to build the, uh, uh, the entire layer, then build it through the thickness. So that is the mathematical, uh, uh, smallest mathematical building block. If you indeed have the three-dimensional heterogeneity, then you have to deal with the three-dimensional domain. And uh, that's, uh, that's a similar concept like as RVE but I will tell the difference between this and the RVE. And uh, we carry out this one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional analysis. We will get uh, the constituent models. For example, if linear elastic, we will get six by six difference matrix for the uh, structure analysis. After you done structure analysis, we can carry out the dehomogenization to get the detailed distribution within the original uh, material. So this is kind of like a generalized uh, computational homogenization method, but they are much more powerful than the RVE analysis, particularly for some of you, if you're familiar with RVE analysis, I did a comparison. First, that the, the users don't have to apply the boundary conditions. When you do RVE analysis, that the, the most challenging part is to apply the correct boundary conditions. And also, our theory automatically satisfies the Mandel condition, and we can prove that. And also, there is no pre and post process needed for our e analysis, what we do is that we take a block of material, apply the right boundary conditions in terms of tractions and displacements, then we do a stress analysis, right? Then we average the stress, average the strain, we will calculate the uh, material properties. That's, that's what I call the uh, pre and post processing. And it will be faster because uh, same analytical, we, we had many examples show that uh, this method converges faster than the RVE analysis. And also we have the capability to compute 3D properties and 3D stress and stream fields out of one dimensional or two dimensional, three dimensional HD. For example, people also take a two dimensional domain to do RVE analysis, but they can only get the implant properties. And also they can only get the three stress components. And uh, this method can compute the complete set of 3D properties using one analysis, we directly compute the stiffness matrix or tangent stiffness matrix for nonlinear analysis. And not like our analysis, apply a certain set of boundary conditions, do a calculation, get the material properties in that direction, that column, then do another analysis, get it in another direction. We only do one analysis. For example, for the fiber reinforced composite, if you look at a lot of other uh, model scale code, they will have this picture uh, showing how they do their RVE analysis. But if you use MSG, uh, this two-dimensional domain will be sufficient, and uh, we will generate the same result. And it's also more versatile, and it's a single theory, but for all heterogeneous materials, 
periodic, partially periodic or a periodic. And also it does not have to be a rectangular shape. It can be arbitrary shape and depends on your material. You may have this kind of microstructures. And we find out that for 3D periodic materials, it will achieve the same accuracy as RVE analysis and asymptotic homogenization, if you heard about it. But for partial periodic or periodic materials, it will always achieve the best accuracy. Because we use the principle of minimal information loss, we make sure that the, the homogenized model and the original model, they have the minimal information loss. And uh, I have a simple illustration here. Usually this is not done by traditional micromechanics lens, but uh, if you view this problem using MSG, actually that's a, a micromechanics problem, the black alumina approach, we treat a stack of laminates as a homogeneous material, okay, kind of like a black alumina. Then the conventional approach, how they do it, they basically you know, use the classical lamination theory to get the A matrix, then get your implant properties. Then the out of plane properties, what they do, we do very, they do various assumptions through the thickness, then calculate the, uh, you know, transverse uh, Young's modulus of Poisson's ratio CTEs. And uh, if we use MSD, we need to answer the question, what would be the original model? Our original model would be 3D continuum mechanics with lay, layer wise heterogeneity. And the model I want is a 3D continuum mechanics model with homogeneity. And uh, the structure gene I have is the transverse normal line. That's basically what I have because I can use this to build the entire structure. Then we minimize the energy loss. We can get the full set of the 3D property for uh, this uh, homogeneous material without make uh, various assumptions. Okay. Uh, how about when we have a structure like a panel and also have a lot of heterogeneous details? And we want to analyze use plate and shear element, say, for example, bending problem and the buckling problem. Then it depends on how this structure is made of. If it's made of homogeneous layers, then the SG will be the transverse normal line because that is my smallest mathematical building block. I can use this line, you know, a sweeping in plane, I can build that three dimensional structure. If we have heterogeneity along one of the uh, implant direction, I dealing with a two-dimensional domain. If I have heterogeneity along both implant directions, I deal with a three-dimensional domain. What I want is the plate models for the plate analysis. If you're talking about the simple plate element, you're talking about ABD matrix uh, to, to input to do your structure analysis. So out of this one-dimensional calculation, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, calculation, we will get the APD matrix. Then you do your plate analysis, then you will go back, get all the uh, stress components you need uh, within the original structure. And uh, there are a few things I want to point out that uh, first that uh, this method provides a uniform uh, theory for all panels. Uh, here I only use plates, but the shells also can be done in a similar way no matter whether it's sandwich or laminates or kind of a corrugated structures or stiffened panels. And uh, in the literature, people have different series, but here it's just uh, uh, it's treated uniformly. Second is that if you view this problem in a different perspective, if I view this uh, two-dimensional plate and shell surface as a two-dimensional continuum, then every material point will have a corresponding microstructure for us to compute the effective structure properties here is effective plate properties, then this will be my global analysis, microscopic analysis. Then after I've done this, I will do dehomogenization to get the local stress. What does it mean? Is that uh, the structure mechanics for plate and shell series become a spatial application of micromechanics. If you view this as a two dimension continue and view this as a microstructure. So in that sense, we unify uh, structure mechanics and macromechanics. And for example, I still use the same problem, uh, a stack of laminate. Now I know that if I treat it as black and luminal, I cannot take care of the flexure property that well, the bending. So what I do, I want a plate model, okay? So your study model is the 3D elasticity model with uh, layer as heterogeneity. Your end model is a two-dimensional classical plate model. And your structure genes still are transverse normal. 
and uh, you can minimize the information loss. At the end of the day, you will derive this model with the uh, uh, plate stiffness. And traditionally, what we do, we take uh, the Kuchikov assumption for kinematics, basically generate a plane strain situation. Then we do a plane stress assumption instead of use C, we use <coughs> Q, right? Uh, sigma IT equal to Q, IG, KL, epsilon, KL. And, uh, but we do know that plane stress and plane strain cannot exist at the same time. And uh, that's contradiction to each other. For this method, we don't have to make that assumption. We just need to minimize the loss of energy between these two models. How about if we have a structure very long? For example, a cup the roller blades. If we have a uniform cross section, or that the blade can be considered as uh, formed by piecewise uh, uniform cross section, then, uh, then the structure gene will be the cross section. And if we also have a heterogeneity along the spinewise direction, we're dealing with a three-dimensional block. And what we want is a torsional stiffness, bending stiffness for my beam models. So that will be done at the one-dimensional level. And uh, after we've done the beam analysis, we can do the homogenization to get the stress distribution of the cross-section over the three-dimensional SG. And uh, again, that uh, if you have a structure as long as it's uh, very long, you want to use a uh, model it as a being any, using being element, then this method will help us to, to produce the right being constants for you to use and also to correct the lo correct the local fields uh, to generate the three dimensional stress. And uh, as I said, for the plate and shell theory and also being theory, the very traditional structure mechanics theory, but if we view this now as a one dimensional continuum, then every material point on this line, you have a corresponding microstructure to generate the effective properties. They are effective beam properties and, uh, and also help us to generate the local fields. So the beam theory also become a special application of uh, the micromechanics in that sense. And some of you, if you have been following my work, I actually started with the beam theory when I was a uh, a uh, PhD student uh, at Georgia Tech with Dewey Hodges solved the head cup the roller blade problem. So the beam theory basically we worked a lot. We almost uh, uh, we completely solved the problem actually because it's, uh, it has been funded by US Army since 1988. We still are funded by them to basically make it to into their framework. Later I will mention about it into their framework to do the design. And it now becomes tools of choice for the helicopter industry and the wind turbine industry. It also provides a very efficient and high fidelity solution for, for very long paths, slender paths, as long as we know one dimension much larger than, the two, than two other dimensions. This is a very recent article. They used our tool to design, uh, to design a blade for NASA. Uh, that's about the theory. Now let me show a little bit of uh, applications. Current uh, active projects uh, apply this uh, method to various type of uh, structures. So the first one is the uh, NASA game changing de development that is a deployable composite booms. And you can see that uh, it's a very long structure and uh, uh, you know, when it's deployed, basically it's kind of like a behave like a beam, but when it's uh, stored, they are basically placed and shells contacts each other. So from the structure perspective, but if you look at uh, the details, it's made of composites, woven composites, simple composites, and uh, uh, viscous behavior is important, and damage and uh, loss of energy is important, and also distortion is important. Uh, like uh, supposedly after you deploy it, that they must be straight, but it's not straight, then uh, the, you know, the effectiveness of your space structure will be affected. And we come up with a model scale approach to tackle this problem. And, you know, we can start from the fiber and the matrix, the viscosity effects really come from the matrix and go step by step there. And uh, at the end of the day, because this structure is so thin, Particular, you know, when you do your characterization, they use the column bending test uh, to to test the bending and the curvature behavior, 
And what we want to ca compute is this uh, bending behavior in terms of fiber and matrix. And that's a simulation we did for their CPT, kind of like a virtual train of that test, the virtual testing for, for, for that uh, perspective. They also did a, a simulation of the entire process uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, the running storage and also uh, deployment. And uh, this is a deployment. Deployment is a, a little bit slow here, and we will wait for a minute. So what we did is that in terms of the fiber matrix properties, we can compute the nonlinear plate and shear stiffness, uh, then treat it as UMAT, then put it into abacus to do the simulation, the elements, we still use abacus shear elements. And this is deployment. And uh, I think this kind of uh, digital uh, model corresponding to the real test or the real structure uh, can be very valuable to to use to explain things and also to reduce the number of experiments we needed. And uh, there is another one. This is very new. And uh, uh, if you look at the model scale, there is inherent uh, problem basically at this global level. Uh, the material is treated as a point, but we know that the, the RVE or SG is not a point. We have a finite size. So sometimes because of that uh, reduction, then we always need to implicitly assume the so-called local, <coughs> local periodicity. At one point, you should have, in the neighborhood, should have similar RVE repeating. Otherwise, it's not a material. Uh, you cannot use RVE analysis, but we do have this kind of situation exist. We don't have this, uh, you know, uh, nicely arranged RVE repeating everywhere. And uh, a lot of time, basically, the heterogeneity is everywhere and uh, they are different. For example, the composite flex beam, they have a lot of pipe jobs and uh, we need to get the detailed stress. And uh, if you, we do a detailed uh, FEA analysis is impossible. Flex beam is pretty thick. You have hundreds of layers. If you want to get accurate stress, you need quite a few layers per, uh, quite a few, quite a few solid elements per layer to do the analysis. And uh, certain type of model scale must be must be needed, but the RVE does not exist, or SD doesn't exist. We don't have so-called smallest mathematical building block. So we come up with the idea. Say, how about that? I homogenize that block of heterogeneous material into a homogeneous solid element. This element is a global element I used in the global analysis, but it contains all the heterogeneity. So basically, this is my original model, which I can reason using MSG. This is my original model, okay, the heterogeneous, heterogeneous system discretized with elements, many elements. And uh, this is my Microscopic model is a single homogeneous element. Here it's 20 node solid element. I want the effective stiffness matrix so that I can do the simulation to do the global analysis. But this will help us to get local stress and strains. Then I can do homogenization to get the effective properties. For this purpose, is the effective element stiffness matrix. It's not the material stiffness matrix anymore. For example, Six uh, at 20 node element, you're talking about 60 by 60 stiffness matrix. And uh, after you've done the global analysis, you do a dehomogenization, you get all the local stress within the original material. You apply your failure, uh, whatever local buckling uh, criterion at that level. So, what we need to do is minimize the loss of energy between these two systems. So, I had a few equations, but I will take through not boring you with this. Basically, still the same idea express displacements in terms of the displacement of the microscopic model. For this purpose, now it's the microscopic nodal values. And I have some unknowns, then I can get the strains, and then I can write out the strain energy of the original heterogeneous system and express the in terms of the nodal values of the homogeneous system. And I can minimize the uh, uh, energy loss, then solve for the unknowns. 
And here, of course, we need to apply some constraints. Constraints first for the microscopic nose, this nose here, because that's the global element. And uh, the real displacement should be the same as what we calculated in the global structure. And uh, then how the surface element, how this how this uh, nodes are not captured in the global analysis, then there are several ways to apply. It depends on your situ situation. If it's a stress free, then we should let it free if it's a free surface. If it's connected with other surface, we need to use so-called periodic boundary condition. In such a way, we allow it to, to vary, to vary in certain fashion. And uh, in terms of the nodal global nodes and also shape functions, then you have another additional flexibility there. After we do the minimization, we will come up with solve a linear system. Then uh, plugging the back to the energy, we'll find out this uh, uh, energy of the heterogeneous system expressed in terms of the global nodes. And that is the 60 by 60 stiffness matrix I'm talking about. And uh, after, after you have the effective stiffness matrix, element stiffness matrix, you can use the user element in Abacus, put that uh, that uh, uh, stiffness matrix into that user element, then you can carry out your analysis. After you've done your analysis, you will get the global nodal values. You can go back to do the dehomogenization, get the local stress and strains. And we did a very simple example, three-layer composite, uh, three-layer composite cantilever beam. And we have a complex loading at this end and kind of labeled here. And it's made of composite resin and some isotropic material. And uh, of course, this is simple enough. We can use hundreds of thousands of elements to do the three-dimensional analysis. We can also simplify in such a way, use 40 MSG-based UEL only. So I will take a chunk of material here to compute the effective stiffness matrix for each of these because they are the same uh, makeup of the material I only need to do once, the homogenization need to do once, and then do the global analysis, then do the uh, dehomogenization to get the stress. And uh, we know that uh, when we do this homogenization, usually we cannot handle the boundary very well. What we can do is that we can keep the boundary still uh, using the original uh, discretization and only the middle part I will replace with uh, uh, this uh, a new uh, user element. And now I have 32 uh, MSD-based user element and also have this uh, regular solid elements. And if you look at the results for this uh, uh, problem, uh, we did a DNS, which is uh, mesh everything uh, with very fine mesh. And, uh, and also pure UEL means 40 UEL elements. Partial UEL means at the two ends, and uh, you have the uh, DNS part and uh, in the middle, this is partial UEL. And the results I take is here, uh, very close to the boundary. Actually, if I, I take it close to the boundary, then they are the same, but uh, this uh, pure UEL, they, they will be very different. But I take this second here, it's close to the boundary, but it's already homogenized. We find out that uh, uh, pure UEL do a good job, not for very small stiffnesses, this transfer stiffness uh, uh, stresses. For the implant stresses, uh, to both approach works okay. But for the transfer stresses, although they're small, could be very important, for example, denomination. Right, and when we use the partial UEL, it's significantly improved. It's very close to the UEL, but uh, the pure UEL has a uh, pretty significant difference. So this method really works pretty well, and uh, uh, we are happy about that. And also another issue about modern scale modeling uh, is, uh, you know, when you look at that for, you know, we can link from fiber to the structural behavior. That's good and uh, cool. And uh, but if you look at our inputs, we need in terms of, uh, you know, fiber matrix properties and the failure criterion, and uh, also the microstructure. Those are the assumptions. And uh, usually it's very difficult to measure the full set of fiber properties, right? And also when we do that link, the although the structure analysis is pretty efficient, but the model scale analysis is still pretty uh, expensive. Although our theory basically come up with most efficient uh, uh, 
approach, but still time consuming. So there are a few limitations. Uh, computing time and the uh, unknowns of the constituent models and properties for the constituents and interfaces and the geometry and topology of the microstructure. That's where machine learning can help us. And that's, uh, it will help us reduce the time by we do, you know, uh, scientifically guided physics-based uh, model scale modeling, then construct the surrogate modeling uh, models trained by machine learning. That's that's uh, most of machine learning work others have been doing. Basically, come up with a better surrogate uh, based on um, data. Data could be high fidelity physics-based uh, simulations. Uh, secondly, that the, to learn these micro scale models and properties using major data, but major data is not as a at that scale, but at the structure scale. And we can use physics informed or physics constrained or physics guided machine learning. Also, we can construct the digital microstructure out of the uh, major data using uh, machine learning. So we have been focusing on to, to understand the unknown, particularly the failure criteria. You know, we have high sheen, but they are all assumed. It's, uh, they may feed a bunch of data okay, but uh, their predictive capability is very limited. So what we do is that based on the experimental data, we try to link the system from the experimental data. And we link in such a way that if we know that they have existing physics, I will use physics model to, to link. If they don't, then I will use uh, an artificial uh, neural network to link it. We could have multiple ANNs and also multiple physics models. Let me uh, use a very simple system to illustrate. For example, that uh, I test my, uh, I did an experiment at my laminate level. Okay, I want to figure out the failure criteria at the laminar level. And uh, what I do is that uh, usually I can have some kind of UMAT that plug into Apicus if I know my failure criteria. It doesn't implement it in Apicus yet then I will implement as you might, then I can do the simulation and match the uh, experimental data. So use this, what we are doing here is that I try to replace that you might with the ANN, with the neural network to be trained by the data measured at the global level. So that is uh, uh, the case because we don't know the you might. I don't know the failure criteria. So it's, it's, it's a black box of the ANN. Uh, in certain fashion, basically what we did is that we take uh, take this uh, machine learning tensor flow, this kind of package apart and uh, use what we needed. Okay, so we express the constituent relations using neural network. We don't know it's a black box. It's a free form assumption if you want to call it. There are ways and files. That's what we need to determine by system level measurements. So. Uh, system, measure, system level measurements is passed through abacus there, and there are sensitivities with basically abacus and the ANN should be constantly communicate, communicate with each other so that we can train the model. We had an example, <coughs> and uh, basically this is our true model. Uh, it's, a, it's a built in damage model in abacus. They did a, a laminate and uh, you know a simple uh, loading system, we will say, can I learn this damage model using this system? I won't, because this is something, you know, uh, it's ad hoc anyway, but I treat it as a choose model, true model. I want to learn that model. So use whatever I do a test at this level and observe uh, force and the displacement at certain points, connect just the data to train my uh, NN. I replace this as AN, so I don't know this. Okay, so that is the result we found out. This is the comparison between the trained data and predicted data. We also have some other data which is not uh, not uh, used for training. It's just used for validation. We also found out that we have pretty good agreement, particular for the axial behavior. It's a uh, nonlinear behavior at a certain stage. It became damaged, but for the uh, 
axial force and uh, lateral displacement is a linear. If you look at the model, you will find out that uh, uh, the flexibility matrix, uh, this turn actually is not damaged uh, at all. So that's why uh, that is happening. We not only can exist, you know, this system not only predict the uh, nonlinear stress uh, force and displacement behavior, we can also generate the stress and strain curve, nonlinear stress strain curve. Although we don't have a mathematical formula to describe it, but this become a trained model, and uh, that trained model can be used as a UMAT for uh, for engineers to do the design, which is uh, particularly for their material. And uh, since we are basically focused on method development and tool development, then we also uh, take technology transform uh, transfer as very serious. And if you are interested. And if you know CDM Hub, we made our code available on CDM Hub. Uh, you can just log in, and then on any computer, you should be able to carry out this analysis I just mentioned uh, pretty uh, easily. You even can do it on your smartphone if you want to do it. We have one code called a GMesh for FC. We integrate our code with uh, a GMesh. Uh, it's for general microstructure, you can do honeycomb and the sandwich structure and all that. And we also integrate our code with TextGen. We can deal with the uh, textile composites and uh, uh, call SwiftCon to, to do the homogenization, dehomogenization. We also uh, create uh, apps for, for students, uh, for, for people who might be interested. It's in terms of iOS and uh, Android, and we have the capabilities. You know, you have the interface on your phone, but actually the back end calculation will be uh, connected back to our server uh, at Purdue. And I mentioned about this, what we are doing with Army right now, they call the Galaxy Road Design uh, System. And uh, I think this is our part. And what they try to do is the, is the digital uh, engineering system they have right now, they want to have all the components for the helicopter design linked together. And uh, this is one of the work. And also we integrated with CATIA. When you do the aircraft design, uh, you have a wing and you want to get the, the you know, elastic axis and torsional stiffness of that uh, section. You can cut a cross section, then you can invoke our code to get the sectional properties. We also integrated with HyperMesh and OptiStruct and that's available now through Altair uh, Partner Alliance APA. Uh, OptiStruck is our optimization code, uh, if you are not familiar. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good one. And we also integrated with Abacus. We have this capability enabled for, for Abacus so that uh, you still take advantage of the traditional finite element analysis capability of Abacus, but uh, with the model scale constituent modeling capability provided by MSG and SwiftCon. They also integrated with uh, ANSYS. If you are ANSYS user, you have this capability through classical ANSYS or Workbench. And we also integrated through uh, with Nastrin. You could have all these material systems and still use traditional uh, Nastrin elements. So as conclusion, the mechanics of structured genome bridges the gap between materials and structures to harvest the full benefits of materials genome initiative. It provides a uniform, a unified uh, modeling for structures and materials featuring anisotropy and heterogeneity. They can eliminate invalid scale assumption, uh, scale separation assumption, and also assumptions within scales and we can achieve the DNS accuracy and the efficiency of simple engineering structure models. And uh, it enables us to model composites and in general heterogeneous and anisotropic materials as simple as the metals, capturing details as needed and affordable. You as an engineer, you do need to decide where you start, where you end. And uh, it can power conventional structure tools with accurate constituent modeling for anisotropic heterogeneous materials and structures. And uh, last but not least, and uh, this method unifies micro mechanics and structural mechanics for model scale constituent modeling. 
uh, in in this book, uh, uh, the critical uh, aspects of science by Jacob Bronowski. They mentioned that the, the progress of science is the discovery either each step a new order, which gives unity to what had long seen unlike, you know, Faraday disease when he closed the link between electricity and the magnesium. And Maxwell did it when he linked both with night, Einstein linked time with space, mass, and energy. So science is nothing else than search to discover unity in the wild variety of nature. And uh, for us, this uh, MSG actually provides uh, a new order or new way of tackle all kinds of structures in a unified way. And uh, that's, I'm pretty uh, satisfied with this academic value of this methodology. This is the last chart uh, as kind of like a, a summary that this is our, all the SDs we tried before. We have tried many, many others. You, you can see that the, the SDs can be up to the ship and uh, can be 3 d woven, can be meta materials, can be short pipe systems, and it can be curved. And uh, it will provide, you know, it can be used for virtual testing of materials. We did, uh, you know, we showed the CPT test, right? It can be get the me mechanical properties or multifunctional properties, and also can use that as component for the model scale modeling of structures. And uh, as we mentioned, we deal with all types of structures, regular composites, different structures, build up structures, and sandwich structures. So that's all I have. I will stop here and to see whether you have any questions. Thank you, Wenbin. I, since I'm chairing the session, I will, um, I will ask the first question. And, 